Well, good morning, uh, CCRW Church family. It's good to be together digitally, even if we can't be together in person. It's been a, a tough week, hasn't it? The numbers have gone up. Uh, the announcements of lockdown have continued. Uh, it's getting heavier. The call on our resources to be uh, resilient, to, to endure, to retain hope, uh, not in ourselves, not in our government, not in our cleverness with vaccines, but hope in the Lord. That, that call is even louder and stronger and more challenging and demanding this week. Uh, it's uh, really uh, great uh, that we can be together in this way, uh, even uh, though not in person, as I say, particularly if you're new or uh, visiting this morning. We want to say especially a warm welcome to you. We hope that you're blessed by this uh, online service. And you'll see uh, that there's a, a little button called Connect With Us, and I just invite you, uh, if you have stepped in today, uh, to take the opportunity to go that next step further and, and connect with us to let us know that you've been here uh, with us this morning and enable us just to reach out to you. Uh, I think we need each other now more than ever, actually, uh, in these difficult circumstances. Our purpose this morning is to lift our eyes, to lift our hearts, uh, to get our head out of the announcements and the numbers and the lockdown and the restrictions and to remember the deep and unseen things, the foundations uh, of our lives. And so hear these words of the psalmist, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. And so we're going to begin our time together by singing a song, a, a praise, a hymn of joy. Joyful, joyful.
Just a few things to announce this morning, let you know about coming up in our life together. Um, each of the uh, congregations, uh, St Albans, St Oswald's and St John's, will have Zoom calls after the uh, live stream service this morning. And so if uh, you're able to stay and just share a little bit in that moment, if you don't have too much Zoom fatigue, uh, that'd be great. And even if you do have Zoom fatigue, um, this one will be worth it. Uh, so there you go. Uh, the second thing uh, to let you know is that we're, we've been partnering with uh, Anglicare, the uh, Anglican uh, social aid and welfare organisation, uh, in a number of different ways uh, recently. And um, one of them is that they've put out a request uh, inviting churches to um, explore the possibility of supporting um, foster care. It's uh, one of those things that I suspect actually under the circumstances that we're in at the moment is more necessary than ever. There's a, there's a greater demand and a greater need and uh, more heartbreak uh, even than ever, ever. And so the opportunity to um, explore the possibility of whether you might be up for foster caring at this time, um, which of course is challenging for you, but then even more challenging for others, um, means that we're going to partner with Anglicare in this. In particular, we're going to have a, an information session on September the 23rd, a uh, few weeks' time, but I want to get that date into your diary now. If you're, if you're open uh, to exploring this possibility, September the 23rd uh, at 7 p.m. We'll do it as a Zoom call um, in all likelihood, though the lockdown has only been extended, uh, well, I guess that is till the end of September, isn't it? So uh, September the 23rd, 7 p.m., uh, as a Zoom call, there'll be an information session with Anglicare about foster care. We've got a, a video from Anglicare uh, to show you about that. My name's Jacob and I'm 8 years old. My name is Jasmine, I'm 11 years old but turning 12. My name is Zach and I'm 14. I really like to play basketball. I like gymnastics, dance and soccer. Woo! I love playing Xbox and I love food. Who doesn't? I actually love writing. Yeah, I'm quite good at drawing actually. I'm not like an artist or anything. I don't really like to talk about my feelings. I don't know what to do with them anyway. That's a person that's going to look after me next. They're going to love to play games with me. Maybe one day I can make a story about my life. Maybe someone could be dead who likes to listen. And maybe they'll help me feel safe. It would be good to have someone who won't give up on me when I push them away. Every kid deserves someone to talk to. Hi everyone. Hi kids. Uh, come on closer. Pop your listening ears on. You might even need your thinking hat. But welcome. We're uh, going to talk about prayer this morning. Now when we talk to God, we call it prayer. Uh, we can pray to God anytime about anything when we're anywhere. Isn't that good? When we talk to God, we can thank him. We can praise him. We can tell him we're sorry for doing things that make him feel sad or angry. And lots of times we ask God to help us with things, problem, or to help someone that we know. It can be pretty easy to speak to God about the things going on for ourselves, but the Bible says that we need to pray for more than just ourselves. In a letter that Paul wrote to his friend Timothy, he says this about prayer. First of all, I ask you to pray for everyone. Ask God to help and bless them all and tell God how thankful you are for each of them. Pray for kings and others in power so that we might live quiet and peaceful lives as we worship and honour God. This kind of prayer is good and it pleases God, our Saviour. In the kids' activity packs, you would have received them recently, you would have seen this picture and it's called the Five Fingers of Prayer. I've got my version here. It's a way to help us pray like the Bible says we need to for people everywhere. So, Let's use the five fingers to help. You can use your own hand. I'm going to use my big hand here. One, we're going to pray for those who are close to us. Hmm, who could that be? Oh, I know, mum, dad, 
brothers, sisters, cousins, grandparents, aunts, uncles, friends, our neighbours maybe. Two, for those in authority. Mm. Now the Bible said the king, but we have a queen. So we pray for the queen, the prime minister, the premier, maybe the head of police, the principal at your school, teachers, maybe it's the doctor that you see. Now three, this tall one, we pray for our leaders. Now, you might have a few of these. You've got your kids' church leaders and your creche teachers. What about your dance or soccer coach, your swimming teachers, your scouts or cubs? Mm, this one, this one's probably the longest list. Pray for those who are weak. Now, could be sick people, people in hospital, babies or very old people. It could be people who don't have a home, maybe like we just heard about in Anglicare. It could be people like refugees. We could pray for compassion and our sponsor children. We could pray for people who are, whose countries are at war. There's lots of people to pray for here. And lastly, we pray for ourselves. What do I need to talk to God about? Do I need to thank him? Do I need to say sorry? Am I feeling worried or scared or sad? Do I need help or comfort? We can come to God and talk to him about the things we need. And so when you're praying for all these people, remember that you can still thank God for them. You can ask God to help people just like you do for yourself. We're going to pray now. I asked Richard if he would use these five fingers of prayer so that we could learn how to pray by listening to him do it. Put your listening ears on. Morning, church. A uh, privilege uh, to lead us in prayer together this morning. Uh, let's come before our Heavenly Father uh, and ask him for our needs and our desires. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you hear us when we pray. We begin this morning by praying for those close to me, close to us. Father, we want to pray for all of those who we live with, for our parents and our siblings, and for all the other people who make up our households together. Please be giving us this week patience, kindness, and gentleness with one another. We pray too for those who are close to us but who we can't see at the moment, for our grandparents, for our uncles and aunties, for our friends. For each of them, please give them safety and please give them comfort as they miss being able to see one another face to face. And give us all good opportunities to connect with each other. Our Father, we also pray for those in authority. We pray for the Queen as she leads the Commonwealth and our nation. We pray for our Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, and our Premier, Gladys Berejiklian, and all those who hold public office in our land. Please give them grace and wisdom as they seek to make good decisions for our state and for our nation. We pray as well for our principals and our teachers, those in authority in our schools. We thank you for their work to keep us uh, working and learning in this lockdown period. Please give them energy, creativity and rest as they seek to serve and lead us. Thirdly, we pray for our leaders. We pray for our leaders in the church, for our archbishop and bishops, for Andrew and the rest of the team uh, here leading us at Christ Church in the West. Give our leaders in our church wisdom as they seek to keep connecting with each of us and helping us to love the Lord Jesus in everything that we do. We pray as well for our kids' church and creche leaders. Thank you for the ways that they are helping us to keep learning about Jesus in these times. Thank you for the way they love us and care for us and pray for us. Our Father, we also pray for the weak, we pray especially for all of those who are sick at the moment and especially those who are sick from the coronavirus. Father, we ask that you would give them good medical care. We ask that you would give them your comfort and peace. Help them, Father, to ask you for help. And we pray that you would help them as well. Especially we pray that there will be less and less people getting sick from coronavirus. And we ask, Father, that in your kindness, you would end this lockdown soon. We pray as well for children who are vulnerable and for their families as well, especially during lockdown. 
For all of those who don't have parents who they can, and, and homes that they can call their own, we ask that you would provide these things for them. Father, we ask that they would know that they have people around them who love and care for them, and especially that they would know that you love them and care for them. We pray for the work of Anglicare in this space. And we ask, Father, that you might put it on the hearts of some from our church to consider be becoming foster parents and even adopting children from these vulnerable places. Please give us wisdom as we consider these things, as we consider potentially bringing other people into our families, just as you've made us a part of your family in Jesus. We pray as well for those uh, whose mental health is, uh, is uh, low at the moment, for those who are anxious and sad. We ask, Father, that you might help us to be looking after those who are feeling low in our community, and also that you would help them to cast all of their cares on you, because you care for them. We pray too for our sisters and brothers at Haverfield Baptist Church as they mourn and process the sudden death of one of their pastoral staff a few weeks ago. Please be with them as they uh, together uh, work out uh, how to care for one another uh, in awful circumstances. Please especially be with their minister, Matt, as he seeks to lead their community through this moment. Finally, Father, we pray for me or really for us. We ask that for us as a church, you'll help us to continue to be focused on the Lord Jesus in all that we do. Help us not to lose sight of our calling in the Lord Jesus. Help us to be people who want to be like Jesus in everything that we do. We pray as well for our wider church family beyond Christ Church Inner West, and we pray especially this morning for those Christians in Afghanistan uh, facing awful circumstances there. We ask that you would bring peace to that nation, that you would protect life and property. And for those sisters and brothers of ours who even today will have their lives called to account for their trust in the Lord Jesus, we pray that you would give them courage and steadfast faith. Father, we thank you for the joy of knowing that in all things it is you who reigns over this earth. And we pray, come, Lord Jesus, come. Finally, Father, we pray for us uh, here in our own church, especially as well as for our sisters and brothers throughout the world, that you will keep our hearts fixed on Jesus, that we will know your comfort and care in all things, and that we will always sing your praises from the heart. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. We're going to conclude our prayers by praying together the prayer that Jesus himself taught us, the Lord's Prayer. The words will be on the screen. Uh, would you, the words won't be on the screen, but you probably know it by heart. Uh, and so would you pray the Lord's Prayer together with me. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our God knows our needs even before we know them. He knows all of our ways. And so we're going to lift our hearts in praise to this God as we sing together. days of peace and days of rest in times of loss and loneliness though rich or poor your word is true that all my ways are known to you no trial has come beyond your hand no step I walk Beyond your plan, the path is dark outside my view. Still, all my ways are known to you. And oh, what peace that I have found wherever I may be. For all my ways are known to you. Death will be the door to life. 
you take my hand and lead me through for all my ways are known to you and oh what peace that I have found where So I may see that you, my God, will walk with me. Open up my eyes so I may see that you have made these ways for me. Open up my eyes so I may see that you, my God, will walk with me. And oh, what peace that I St. John's Church. I'm normally part of 10 a.m. Sometimes I go to 6 p.m. because I have teenage sons and that's where they go and especially during lockdown it's nice to go to church with them. The first reading for today is from Isaiah chapter 43 verses 1 to 7. But now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God the only one of Israel, your saviour. I give Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my sight and honoured, and I love you. I give people in return for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not withhold them. Bring my sons from far away and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. The second reading for today is from one of Paul's letters, and it's Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 to 30. I want you to know, beloved, that what has happened to me has actually helped to spread the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers and sisters, having been made confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, dare to speak the word with greater boldness and without fear. Some proclaim Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. These proclaim Christ out of love, knowing that I have been put here for the defence of the gospel. The others proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but intending to increase my suffering in my imprisonment. What does it matter? Just this, that Christ is proclaimed in every way, whether out of false motives or true, and in that I rejoice. 
Yes, I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. It is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in any way, but that by my speaking with all boldness, Christ will be exalted now as always in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, living is Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor, labor for me. And I do not know which I prefer. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them, this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation. And this is God's doing. For he has graciously granted you the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well. Since you are having the same struggle that you saw I had, and now here that I still have. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dave Bingley. I'm on the staff at Christ Church in the West and the site pastor at St. Albans Five Dock. For millions in lockdown, Ted Lasso has become the perfect pick-me-up, cheerful comfort viewing, giving us windows of relief from our grim pandemic reality. The comedy series follows the story of an American football coach, Ted Lasso, recruited to coach an English Premier League soccer team, a game he knows nothing about. He was hired to destroy the team through his ineptitude, a plan hatched by the current owner of the team, Rebecca, to spite her cheating ex-husband, whose only true love was the team. It's a pretty attractive plotline, but the genius of the story is the character himself, Ted Lasso. There's something about his endless optimism, albeit a very American style of optimism. I believe in hope, he says. I believe in believe. And when asked whether he believes in ghosts, he answers, I do, but more importantly, I think they need to believe in themselves. Not to mention the first change he made to the player's locker room, sticking a poster with the word believe at the entranceway. The show's optimism has struck a chord, picking up 20 Emmy nominations after its first season, the most for a debut season of a comedy show. And one of the features of his optimism, at least in season one, I'm yet to start season two, is that it spreads. One reviewer writes this, Ted seems to not only be a character, but a powerful infection. Eventually, everyone is disarmed. That's the viewer's experience of the show as well. You're resistant, you're worn down, and then happily, you submit. We happily submit. We all want to be a little bit like Ted. His life isn't easy. He certainly has problems of his own, not only the hostile UK press or the club's owner, but he meets life's difficulties and outright hostilities with warmth, humour and optimism. And of course, freshly baked shortbread biscuits. And there's something about this that we want in ourselves as well. This morning, we continue in our lockdown series, taking our time walking through Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, written from lockdown, a cold, dark prison. He experiences some serious isolation and deprivation. His life is teetering on the edge. And yet he says in verse 12, I want you to know, beloved, 
that what has happened to me has actually helped to spread the gospel. Verse 18 and 19, yes, I will continue to rejoice, for this will turn out for my deliverance or salvation. And verse 21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Are these pretty astounding remarks of the apostle simply a result of him having an inbuilt disposition to see the silver linings? Sort of like Ted, who seems to be able to miraculously screen out or push down all the negative and genuinely difficult experiences of life? Or is Paul's hopeful outlook based on something very different? So let's jump into the passage, and as we do, you'll notice that there'll be something like a J-curve, as Andrew mentioned last week, to this morning's sermon. So first, suffering with Jesus. To understand the basis of Paul's outlook, we need to see that his current experience isn't accidental. Paul's imprisonment and he's coming to a point where he's seriously grappling with the possibility of death have put his life on a familiar trajectory. So let's look at the bookends of this morning's passage, verses 12 to 13. I want you to know, beloved, that what has happened to me has actually helped to spread the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is, and I'm going to make an adjustment to the translation, my imprisonment is in Christ. Some translations try to make verse 13 easy to understand. My imprisonment is for Christ. That is, he's in chains because of Christ, and of course that's true. But Paul specifically uses a different phrase in the original language. He's not in prison for Christ, but in Christ. Now, on the surface, this translation is a little less clear, but it's tapping into something crucial about Paul's thought. You see it everywhere in the New Testament. For Paul, when he first began to follow Jesus, it's as if he found himself in a new story. Instead of living out the story of violently zealous Judaism, which is the storyline he was living, he jumped into Jesus' story, the gospel story, the story of dying and rising. His story is, in a sense, in Jesus' story. And so back to verse 13, Paul's imprisonment is in Christ. Christ Jesus suffered, and now Paul is sharing in those sufferings. Paul suffers in solidarity with Christ. Paul's life story has been swept into Jesus's. Paul's life takes on the shape of Jesus's, the J curve, which helps us understand the other bookend of the passage, verse 29. For he has graciously granted you the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well. The gift of faith comes with another gift. We've literally been graced with suffering, which flows from our devotion to Jesus. Our faith in Jesus draws our lives into his story so that our lives take on the imprint of his life story, which had suffering as a feature. It happened to Paul, it happened to the Philippians, and it'll happen to us. It's a theme in this letter. From chapter 3, verse 10, I want you to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship or participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. The suffering that Paul speaks of here is suffering which results from our devotion to Jesus. We could call it Jesus-shaped suffering. Missing out on a promotion at work because you refuse to join the boss's Gossip, persisting in holiness when you could more easily give in to sin, buying a smaller house than you could afford in order to allow more generous giving, risking relationships because you won't compromise on the gospel. These are all forms of suffering that you wouldn't have if you weren't a follower of Jesus. They're Jesus-shaped sufferings. But I think what Paul says about Jesus-shaped sufferings also applies to our more generic experiences of difficulty and suffering, a medical diagnosis, a difficult employer, financial stresses. These experiences, whether they directly flow from devotion to Jesus or not, are God's means of grace to grow you. It's not that the difficult experiences are of themselves good, far from it. But God is so good and so powerful that he is able to drag good from evil. Namely, it's in our suffering that we share in Jesus' suffering. And the most remarkable good is wrenched from this. We get to know Jesus in a new way. Joni Erickson Tata, an international advocate for people with disabilities and her, um, herself a quadriplegic, writes, when life is rosy, we may slide by with knowing about Jesus, with imitating him and quoting him and speaking of him, 
But only in suffering will we know Jesus. There's some pretty strong words. Uh, There's an example of this in the J-Curve book that was mentioned in the E! News last Thursday. The author's daughter, Emily, was in year 11 and she was rising through the ranks in field hockey. But in year 11, she found herself on the bench a lot because the coach's two daughters were in the same team and they always got a run at Emily's expense. Now, this isn't very significant suffering, but Paul Miller, the the dad who sees Jacobs everywhere, uh, though uh, he was frustrated and offered to talk to the coach on Emily's behalf, Emily didn't want him to, um, Paul Miller saw this as an opportunity for Emily. So in Paul's words, Paul Miller's words, to know Jesus, not just through faith, through saving faith that Jesus suffered for us, but through a living faith that participated in his life. This was an opportunity for Emily to know this. If Emily embraces the fellowship of his sufferings in her benching, it will draw her to Christ in ways she has not experienced before. She could know Jesus better through sitting on the bench than through starring on the field. Now, it might seem pretty trivial, this example, but our lives are full of experiences like this. It was an opportunity for Emily to know Christ more, not just by faith, but also by experience, a fellowship in his sufferings, as Paul puts it in chapter 3, verse 10. Knowing Jesus in suffering is like the difference between doing a business certificate at TAFE and starting a business. It's like the difference between babysitting and actually being parents. When we suffer in some way, whether mild or more severe, we enter a world that Jesus has inhabited. We get to know him in a new way. It's a type of knowing that only comes with experience. When we suffer, we enter into Jesus' narrative. Do you see how viewing our lives in this way as following Jesus' story is the starting point for Paul's hopeful outlook? Not only does it normalize our difficulties, it's the narrative God is taking his people through. Not only does it put us in a place where we know Jesus in a new way, But crucially, it tells us what comes next. The J curve goes down and then up. Our difficulties, our weaknesses are the launch pad for resurrection. So second, rising with Christ. In verse 12, Paul says, I want you to know, beloved, that what has happened to me has actually helped to spread the gospel. And now look down at verse 19. He says, I want you to see that what has happened, the evil and terrible things that have happened to him, will turn out for my deliverance. Paul's saying, I know that as bad as this is, it's working both historical good and personal good. Paul wants to plant churches, but he never would have planned to do a mission to the Praetorian Guard unless God had brought him into this situation. He he has a captive audience now to his evangelist. Two or three times a day, a mean-spirited pagan Praetorian Guard is chained to the most effective and persuasive evangelist who has ever lived, and one by one, they're getting converted. A famous commentator from the 1600s, Matthew Henry, responding to these verses, verses 12 to 14, wrote that God is the only alchemist. Back in the Middle Ages, alchemists were people who were trying to find the secret for turning lead into gold. Lead, as they thought, was a base, useless thing, but if only they could somehow turn it into gold. Of course, no one ever found a way, but Matthew Henry says, Paul is saying that God does that all the time with the circumstances of your life. When Paul comes into a situation, he actually starts by asking, I wonder how God is going to turn this base and worthless situation into gold. He's looking for a mini resurrection in his present suffering. Now, I don't think Paul believes that the fact that he was winning the Praetorian Guard to Christ is a sufficient reason for why he should be taken away from his career and for uh, possibly and possibly lose his life but what paul does is he doesn't expect to see the whole picture he comes into a situation like this of difficulty and tragedy and he says i wonder how god is turning this into gold i hope i can see just a glimpse of god's resurrection power even here he's looking for it and he sees just a little glimpse but paul doesn't stop there and we can't either Because most of the time when we come into times of tragedy and suffering and injustice, we mightn't see the alchemy. We don't see how God is turning this situation really into something good. Look at verse 19. 
For I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me, the injustices and the difficulty, will turn out for my deliverance. Or more literally, the original language says, uh, what has happened to me will result in my salvation. It's not in spite of what happens to me I will be saved. It's I will be saved because of this horrible thing. Paul doesn't just come into a situation of tragedy and, tragedy and ask, in what way is God turning these circumstances uh, beautiful? In what way is he turning the lead into gold in these circumstances? He's also saying, I rejoice because I know that the suffering and tragedy, whether I end up facing execution or not, is saving me. It's refining me. It's making me more like the person I want to be. It's making me more like my saviour, more a man of love, more a man of humility. It's not just that Paul says God can turn my base circumstances into gold. He says he's going to turn me into gold through this. Paul's saying I need this. Resurrection, even small signs of new life, follows suffering. And what gives Paul such confidence that God is the alchemist turning difficulty and even seemingly worthless situations into gold? It's because of the resurrection. God turning the darkest point of human history into glorious life. It's like that we're, we're in a darkened room with, with lots of shadows, and the resurrection of Jesus in the past is this brilliant light at the center of the room, and the light from it reaches the present and sheds its light in our life. Paul sees the past resurrection as a present reality by the power of the Spirit. And so Paul is constantly on a hunt for resurrection light in the present, not just the future, by the power of the Spirit. He is looking for many resurrections in the present, God working in the bad to turn it into gold. So suffering with Christ, rising with Christ, and to live is Christ. Uh, but for, for us to make sense of how at the brink of death, Paul can still rejoice. He mentions the word rejoice two times in the passage. We need to begin to get our heads around verses 20 to 22. It is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in any way, but that by my speaking with all boldness, Christ will be exalted now as always in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, living is Christ and dying is gain. We read over those words so quickly, but they're, they're so profound. For me to live is Christ. Paul's saying that the thing that makes life life for him is Jesus. He's the bottom line. Jesus is the bottom line. In prison, Paul's career is over. He can't plant churches anymore. But his career is not his life. So what, Paul says, I may live, I may die, it doesn't matter. It hasn't touched my life. Christ is our life, then when difficulties and hardships set in, we're not gonna, that's not going to block us from life, but they're going to draw us closer to it. You're joining the fellowship of his sufferings. You're getting to know Christ, your life, more intimately, right there in the valley. And when God works resurrection power in the present, when God turns the lead into gold, we can rejoice because we're learning more and more the power of Christ's resurrection, Christ's life in our life. We're growing in our knowledge of Christ and his power. Having such a transformed view of what actually constitutes our life doesn't just happen. For us ever to say, for me to live is Christ, we need more and more to see that Jesus Christ, second person of the Trinity, says of us, for me to live is you. My life, Jesus says, is to see you holy and happy. My life is to see you sanctified. Everything in Jesus' life was subservient to that goal. Just like Olympic athletes live their life prior to the Olympics in order to get one goal. They direct their life in order to get that goal. That's what Jesus did for us. That's why the Gospels have one focal point, Jesus on the cross for us. The more you consider and think about and see that for Jesus to live is you, it'll lead you to say, if for you to live is me, well then for me to live is you. At the outset, I asked whether the apostle's optimism was simply a result of him having an inbuilt predisposition to see the silver linings, like Ted Lasso. 
I hope you see that for Paul, the basis of his hopefulness or optimism is absolutely Jesus-centered. He rejoices in his sufferings because it's there he knows Jesus more. He lives in anticipation and hopefulness because he knows the story that after suffering comes resurrection. And nothing will budge him from living like this because Jesus, the all-conquering one, is his life. Let's pray. Father, help us to see our lives as connected to Jesus, going down with him and up into glory. Give us the power to not lose hope in suffering, but work through the suffering by the Spirit and produce gold in us and around us. In the name of the one whose life was lived for us. Amen. Well, God is the great and only alchemist, uh, the only one who can take uh, the lead, the dross, uh, even the sin of our lives and turn it into something else, turn it into gold, turn it into a transformed heart through his grace. That's the, the means of his transformation, actually. It's our repentance, our recognition and ownership of the ways in which we've lived, not for Christ, but for ourselves, and to, to bring that before the Lord, and then he covers it with his grace. Listen to this confession from Daniel in Daniel chapter 9. The, the prophet knows the Lord. He writes, O Lord, in view of all your righteous acts, let your anger and wrath, we pray, turn away. Because of our sins, we have become a disgrace among all our neighbours. Now therefore, O oh our God, listen to our prayer. And for your own sake, Lord, let your face shine upon us. Incline your ear, O oh my God, and hear. Open your eyes and see us. We do not present our supplication before you on the ground of our righteousness, but on the ground of your great mercies. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and act and do not delay. And so let's join together and pray, knowing that God is the great transformer, the great forgiver, the great healer. Together. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have gone our own way and broken your holy laws. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us, and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you and to please you more and more. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Apostle's confident that as we come to the Lord, to our Father in repentance and faith, our God is the great transformer. He takes us and he makes us something different, something better, something purer, something more holy. And so the Apostle's prayer was that we would be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power and that we may be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father because he has enabled us to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transformed us into the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of of sins. And so we're going to sing again in praise to this great transforming Father in heaven. Christ is enough.
that could ever satisfy Through every trial My soul will sing No turning back I've been set free Christ is enough for me Christ is enough for me Everything I need is in you and Everything I end of our live stream service, can I remind you that there'll be uh, Zoom calls for each of the congregations directly after the service finishes. That'll uh, give you a welcome opportunity to, to not do Gladys O'Clock. Just, just have a break, uh, enjoy the fellowship of uh, your sisters and brothers in Christ, and, uh, and you can catch up on the news uh, in just a moment. We're going to finish our service by praying together uh, one of the prayers uh, from uh, the prayer book, it's a beautiful prayer of thanks and uh, commitment of ourselves and each other uh, to the Lord. So let's pray together to finish our service. Lord, our Heavenly Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, we thank you for bringing us safely to this day. Keep us by your mighty power and grant that we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but lead and direct us in all things, that we may always, always do what is righteous in your sight, 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Good day.